Last week, someone asked me if I could make a video about how a lay person could parse a science paper. Uh, and I thought that that was a great idea. And I made a note to record something this week. But then a few days later, someone else sent me a Medium post uh, called Evidence Over Hysteria, COVID-19, insisting that I read it because of how good it is. I didn't know what to expect going into it, so I started reading it with high hopes because it seemed that the author wanted to use scientific data to reassure the general public that they shouldn't be panicking. And that's great. That's something that I've been saying since January. Don't panic. Panicking doesn't fix anything. It just creates new, shittier problems like literally shittier now that we're running out of toilet paper. But then I read the piece and by the third sentence, I had to stop and go back and see who had written this because I had assumed that it was an epidemiologist or some kind of science communicator. But well, you'll see why I realized my mistake so quickly in a minute. Spoiler alert, it was not written by an epidemiologist. Um, at that point, I realized, oh, this is my next video because uh, this article clearly got a lot of positive attention from people promoting it as good science, despite it not actually being based on science at all. So yeah, instead of talking about how to read a science paper, um, let's talk about how to read something presented as good science in the popular media. Um, I want to talk about how to not get conned by partisan hacks who are pretending to do science. Uh, this isn't going to be a complete debunk of that Medium post. Uh, Medium ended up taking it down, and there's honestly way too much in there to debunk for just one video. Uh, so I'm just going to pick out a few examples to help illustrate five tips for how you should be reading science breakdowns like this. Tip one is know your source. Uh, in this case, the author is Aaron Jin, who is a Silicon Valley marketing guy. Does that mean that he's wrong? No. Uh, but you do need to ask yourself this. What does the scientific consensus have to say about this issue? And what is this author arguing? In this case, the consensus of epidemiologists are telling us that COVID-19 is an emergency pandemic that needs to be mitigated by extreme measures to prevent significant loss of human life. The author is arguing that COVID-19 isn't that big of a deal and we shouldn't bother doing things like sheltering in place. If the author of this piece was an epidemiologist, you would want to read his dissenting opinion carefully. If the author of this piece is a former writer for Breitbart with no previous expertise in science, you would want to read it with extreme skepticism. Think of it this way. Most physicists think that dark matter exists. If a respected physicist wrote a paper about an alternative hypothesis that involves modifying general relativity, it might be worth your time to read. But if your accountant writes a paper on that same subject, you would be forgiven for finding better things to do with your time because it's probably going to take a theoretical physicist to point out all of the things that are wrong. So adjust your bullshit detector accordingly. I do want to point out that uh, who wrote the piece is not a good uh, or valid response to this. If someone shows you this article who believes it, they're not going to suddenly stop believing it because you say the guy who wrote this is a dumb dumb. Uh, if you do want to convince them, you're going to have to read the piece and point out exactly why he's a dumb dumb in this particular argument. So with that in mind, and knowing that we are now on high skeptic alert, let's move on to tip number two, which is to always click the links. Uh, this is what initially tipped me off upon my first quick read through. Aaron Jin writes in the first paragraph, when 13% of Americans believe they are currently infected with COVID-19, mathematically impossible, full on panic is blocking our ability to think clearly and determine how to deploy our resources to stop this virus. Jin supports his 13% figure by linking to this article, uh, in which a survey company says that in a poll of 500 people, 10% said that they think they currently have COVID. 
At first, I assumed Jin must have just mistyped, but after reading the survey data, I realized that what he actually did was he got that 13% figure by looking at a chart that only considered about half of the respondents, those who gave their age, not the full survey of 500. So that is, by definition, a less rigorous number than the 10% figure. But Jin still scrolled down, he went through the data until he found the highest number he could, and he used it. And while it's a very minor quibble, it's a difference of 3% in an informal survey that doesn't really change how we should react to COVID-19, it's a very good example of what Jin does through the rest of the article. Um, if you click the links, if you seek out the actual citation, you will find uh, that the person you're reading isn't necessarily truly representing the data. You might be surprised at how often people fail to look at sources, which is why people who say want to trick people into thinking that the science is on their side can just throw in a link or a citation that completely contradicts them and just trust that the average reader isn't going to bother to click it, let alone read it in full. As another example, Jin's very next sentence is over three fourths of Americans are scared of what we are doing to our society through law and hysteria, not of infection or spreading COVID-19 to those most vulnerable. The link he gives goes to a Yahoo News article about a Harris poll. Like the first half of his sentence says, the poll did find that 79% of respondents said drastic headlines about how society is changing is the number one reason they are fearful, with many of the respondents saying that they were freaked out by hysterical people fighting over toilet paper, though there was no mention of law, despite Jin's words. Uh, it's the second part of his sentence, though, that is just a blatant lie um, that is debunked in that same link. Jin says those people are not scared of infection or spreading COVID-19 to those most vulnerable. But that poll actually did find that 74% of Americans are afraid of accidentally spreading the virus to vulnerable people, even if they are asymptomatic. Like, they even use the word vulnerable. You could just control F that shit. Sometimes you don't even have to click the link to find Jin's lie. A little bit later on, he claims in a headline that 1% of cases will be severe. And to illustrate that, he includes a pyramid showing that by mid-February in China, 2.3% of cases died. How severe does he consider severe? Like, can you imagine your mom calling you and saying, your brother's been in an accident? Oh no, was it severe? No. Thank God. I mean, he did die, but it wasn't severe. No, that's severe. Death is severe. He got the 1% number by considering how many cases were severe compared to everyone who was ever tested for COVID, regardless of if they actually had it or not. That's a different and pretty pointless in this instance number uh, compared to the ones in the chart. He's comparing apples and oranges and hoping that you won't notice. If he was being accurate to his own graphic he's providing, the headline would read 21.3% of cases would be severe. He didn't do that because that doesn't fit with his narrative that COVID-19 isn't a big deal. This brings me to tip number three. Don't be taken in by headlines and graphics. Even in good science journalism, headlines aren't often written by the writer of the article and graphics aren't necessarily chosen by them. Hell, uh, this happened to me a few years back when I was doing a video on DNA and my video editor slotted in a picture of red blood cells, which generally don't have DNA. Oops. Headlines and graphics are extremely good for persuading people because they're pretty and easy to digest, but they're not always good at communicating facts. So don't be tricked. Tip number four, don't be intimidated by jargon. Uh, Jin tells us to watch the bell curve, but what does that mean? He writes, bell curves is the dominant trait of outbreaks. A virus doesn't grow linearly forever. It accelerates, plateaus, and then declines. Whether it is environmental or our own efforts, viruses accelerate and quickly decline. This fact of nature is represented in Farr's Law. 
That's more or less correct, but it's strange to call it a fact of nature, which is never something you would hear out of a scientist's mouth. And it's equally strange to randomly name drop Farr, a researcher who did suggest that epidemics may follow a regular curve back in the 19th century. Jin throws all of this at us with uh, this chart, which he says is a graph from Italy showing a bell curve in symptom onset and number of cases, which may point to the beginning of the end for Italy. He wants you to look at that chart and see that bell curve and assume that he's right. Italy is going to be just fine. Farr's law says so. The bell curve says so. But wait, what's that written right there on the chart? Data in the shaded area should be interpreted with caution due to the possible reporting delay of more recently diagnosed cases and cases with date of onset within the reporting period that have not yet been diagnosed. This is something that researchers have been yelling about for the past two months. We don't have all the data. We aren't testing everyone in a population. Our numbers will, therefore, always be inadequate and they will always be several days to up to a week behind the curve the bell curve, if you will. So I guess we're just gonna have to wait and see if Jin was right and if that really was the beginning of the end for Italy. Oh, hold on, we don't have to wait because the chart he used was from March 15th, about a week before his own article was posted. March 11th was the last date with confirmed data on that chart showing 2,313 newly discovered cases. If Jin was right, it should be going down now. However, there were 2,600 the next day and the day after that, and then 3,500, and then a few days later, there were 4,200, and a few days after that, on March 21st, there were 6,500 confirmed cases in a day. Does that mean that the epidemiological bell curve is untrue, that Farr's law is wrong? No, it means that you trusted some jabroni who can't read the legend on a chart he's posting to tell you how a general rule of thumb, not a fact of nature, might apply to this particular pandemic. The major drawback of Farr's law is that we are hampered based upon how much data we can collect. And when you've got one epidemic in a shady ass place like China and another one in the United States where people with COVID-19 symptoms can't get tested unless they're an NBA player or literally need life support, uh, lay people like Jin and like me can't make pronouncements about where the top of the bell is going to be. That's why I leave it to the professionals, like the et epidemiologists at the WHO and CDC. And I just tell you what they are telling the general public. This video is already way too long to talk about everything Jin screws up. Um, I might do another video on some of his other points in the future if I see that that misinformation is spreading, like the idea that COVID-19 will die off during the summer. Scientists absolutely do not know if that will happen. Um, so I'll just end with my final tip, number five. Don't fall for the gish gallop. Uh, I've talked about the Gish Gallop in previous videos. It's the technique pioneered by the creationist Dwayne Gish, who could spew so much bullshit that it would take any debate opponent months to dissect and debunk each of his points. Don't be impressed by the utter volume of arguments put forth by people like creationists, 9-11 truthers, flat earthers, or Aaron Jen. Please listen to the epidemiologists. Stay inside, wash your hands, don't visit friends, play some video games. If we get enough tests to start testing everyone like South Korea, or if the disease peters out, we can get back to normal. I assure you that the hit our economy takes will be nothing compared to the hit it would take in the worst case scenario of millions of people with critical illnesses that stop them from working or that stop them from living. Uh, I know it's the working part that has all the market guys worried. Uh, if this were a zombie pandemic and they found a way to put the zombies to work later, our stock market would probably be through the roof.